My name's Trey Goodhue, and I am the Assistant Curator of Education here at the Tri-Cities Historical Museum. I would like to welcome you to segment two of our three-part series entitled, We Were Here Too, exploring West Michigan's queer past. If you hadn't had a chance to see our first segment covering the Saugatuck Douglas area with presenters from the Saugatuck Douglas History Center, I welcome you to go check those out on our Facebook page or YouTube channel. Segment two covers Grand Rapids with presenter Amina Shakur, who is a Grand Rapids native, art historian, and accessibility coordinator for the Grand Rapids Pride Center. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Amina take it away. Hi, I'm Amina Shakur. I am an art historian in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and currently the accessibility coordinator at the Grand Rapids Pride Center. I also have a minor in museum studies and I'm currently an MA student at Kendall College of Art and Design in visual and critical studies. I am a member of the queer community here in Grand Rapids. I grew up here in Grand Rapids and came out officially as bisexual when I was 16. So I've been a member of the queer community here in Grand Rapids for a very, very long time. I now also identify as non-binary and so queer in multiple ways. I am here to talk about queer history in Grand Rapids, which I'm proud to say that I am a part of that history as many viewers here will be also. My experience of that history is limited really to the 90s and beyond. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some things that happened in the 80s that I've been able to find in research and and then really more what I know based on personal experience and what I have seen since then. So I wanted to start really with we always think about activism as the first thing and the thing that we're proud of, right? We have to talk about, unfortunately, the, the fact that we've had to fight for our right to exist. So, so we really start with always organizations that began really to talk about supporting queer people whether as lesbians, as gay people, as bisexuals, and, and also, you know, trans people, even though I will say that when I was younger, we didn't have good language around those things so much, and we weren't quite as expansive in our understandings of gender or sexuality, for that matter. But intersex, asexuality, pansexuality, those sorts of things definitely existed at that time as well. We just didn't have the same language that we have now. So we're more expansive and broader thinking and have better terms for those things now. But I, and, and our organizations weren't as inclusive or thoughtful in regards to those things at that time, but, but our organizations did exist originally, primarily to address lesbian and gay issues. We also know that those organizations oftentimes were unfortunately rather racist and primarily were funded by a certain uh, social class, which means they, they only addressed issues for that social class and weren't always very thoughtful of the ways that poverty impacted disproportionately certain segments of our communities either. I think that that is an issue that we are talking about much more today than we were originally and that we're making some strides on but have a really long way to go and we're talking much more today about things like the undocumented community and immigration in a general sense as well and about racism and anti-blackness and indigenous communities and settler issues and things like that that were not being addressed by our organizations in the 80s and 90s very well at all. So to be really clear, like those organizations did exist, but it's not fair to say that they were fighting for all of us. And we want to celebrate the fact that they existed and that they, and that they were fighting, but, but we also want to, want to acknowledge that we have a long road ahead of us for really fighting genuinely for everyone in the community and understanding the needs and the different needs 
of everyone in the community and ensuring that everybody's needs are always being thought about and that the most marginalized people in the community, that if we're fighting for them, first and foremost, that ultimately everyone gets a seat at the table. And that when we when we focus primarily on the most marginalized, that that brings everybody up in the long run. So originally, the first organization was the Lesbian and Gay Community Network of West Michigan. And that was established in 1988. It has gone through multiple iterations since then. It became the network. It's gone through a few different names and different uh, organizational styles. It is now the Grand Rapids Pride Center, which has, you know, completely new leadership. Obviously, it's gone through multiple boards, multiple leadership styles since then. Uh, the Grand Rapids Pride Center currently runs a multitude of support groups supporting various members of the community. It runs all sorts of educational programming. It runs medical clinics, open houses, all, all sorts of different, different things for the community. And that, that really is born out of the original mission, but it has become much more expansive and much more supportive than, than what it originally was envisioned to be. Also, one of the things that the original organization did that the Pride Center continues to do, of course, is the first Pride Festival, uh, which also was established in 1988. It happened in what is now the Rosa Park Circle. At the time, it was called the Downtown Amphitheater, and it was very small at the time, but, but had fairly decent attendance, actually. And that's where, where it was held for several years. I attended the first one. I was in the eighth grade. Well, just graduated the eighth grade, actually. So between the eighth and ninth grade and attended that one um, with a couple of friends. And, you know, it was, it was pretty low key, to be honest. And that's where it was held for the first several years before it moved on to being held at Riverside Park for a few years and then moved back to to the amphitheater, which also went through a couple of different names before it became Rosa Park Circle. And, and that really grew as an event as well as, as everyone knows. And, and that's morphed and changed. And of course, as, as we all know, in 2020, we weren't able to have that event due to the pandemic. But in 2019, that was an event that was attended by about 10,000 people. So that is a really, really huge event now in Grand Rapids that went from really humble beginnings to to a really huge festival that actually celebrates all of queer community. It did originally begin not only as a celebration, but also as an educational thing. Um, Originally, it, it, it primarily was booths and educational materials and things of that nature. It's, it's worth noting that one, one of the first other activities that happened in Grand Rapids was the Grand Rapids AIDS Task Force that, that did come together even before the Lesbian and Gay Community Network, specifically to address HIV, and that was funded by gay community members, and it was funded and founded uh, specifically to a to address issues in the gay community, but it certainly didn't only serve gay people because obviously AIDS is not only a gay issue. It eventually developed into the AIDS Resource Center, which is when I came to know of it in the early 90s. And the services that they were providing were really, literally, they they ran a food bank, they provided transportation to medical appointments, they were providing some advocacy because at that time, doctors were telling us, you know, our own doctors were telling us if we were concerned not to tell them that we were gay and not to tell them that we needed an HIV test. There were specific clinics like Macaulay Health Clinic to go to if you need an HIV test. They were telling us, you know, don't tell us, don't ask us because if it, you know, gets put on your record then other doctors will not see you and they will not treat you. At the time, the ER was was saying, you know, that doctors, if they knew you were gay, would refuse you treatment. 
And so the AIDS Resource Center was one of the places that was really doing the work. They had a whole bevy of volunteers that were attending appointments with people and especially with, with people who actually did had tested positive already and needed care. They were attending those appointments and advocating for them and with them and pushing doctors to provide care. They, they were setting up HIV positive people with a buddy, somebody, somebody who would just hang out with them. And so they wouldn't feel so isolated all the time. They were providing financial support. They were ensuring that people had caregiving, um, especially as they got sicker. And, and then later they also began to invest in actual prevention and education and those sorts of things. Uh, I was part of some of their efforts. There, there were some, some actual marches and also efforts to provide condoms in some of the local cruising spots and areas like that, making free condoms available, going to the cruising areas and handing condoms out, handing out pamphlets, having discussions about safer sex practices, about risk factors, about access to testing, about the importance of getting tested, talking about HIV in ways that, that attempted to reduce the stigma of it, and, and also attempted to talk about the fact that it wasn't just gay people getting it, and, and that, you know, that there were ways to prevent it, but also ways to live and, and continue to have a life, even if you are positive, you know, and ways to get support and, and ways to maintain friendships and, and have the care that you need, that you shouldn't have to go without care, that, that there, there's an organization that exists to ensure and support groups and those sorts of things to ensure that, that you still have the medical care that you need and, and, you know, that you still have housing and the other things that, that every human being has a right to. And, and that you absolutely need when you're sick. So, so I, I was somewhat involved in that. A lot of my friends were involved in that. Some of us more formally through the organization and some of us less formally just getting involved and in just having, you know, really informal conversations with, with our friends, just always carrying condoms and having conversations or handing them out or, you know, gifting them. A lot of times uh, that, that was a really common Christmas gift, to be honest, was literally just giving condoms to friends as Christmas gifts around that time. The Red Project is the current primary organization for that, and that was established in 1998. We've had a few different AIDS-related organizations in between there, including the CARES Project that reached out predominantly to the local Latina um, population. A lot of those have been absorbed and or closed down around, around the way that the health department has managed HIV. So we've had organizations that have come and gone due to the way that funding and those sorts of things have functioned in our city. I would say somewhat to our detriment because I think more organizations is better than less. And again, it's really important to understand that HIV is not limited to the gay community, but I do think that there is value in the fact and in recognition of the fact that the queer community stepped up really early on and, and really did take the reins of managing communications and services and actually pulled from their own pockets to fund a lot of those services and care for themselves and each other around this issue. In relation to the Pride Fest, the AIDS quilt uh, was actually brought to Grand Rapids by GRCC in 1990, and I was able to see that also. And the founder, Cleve Jones, spoke at the Grand Rapids Pride Festival that year the Pride Festival did bring him in to speak and talk about the importance of that. And so that was really powerful and a really wonderful thing to witness, but also really educational and really brought home how important that is and, and how important it is for our community to rally around those things and care for each other. Around that same time was when I started to attend the Windfire Youth Support Group. And that was a group that had been started 
in the late 80s by a young man named Sean Lynch, who I actually had the pleasure of meeting and knowing um, him and his family. He did actually die of HIV and AIDS in 1993 or 94, but he was the one who, as a teenager, did start that group originally. And when I started attending it, he, he had already aged out of the group. It was a really phenomenal group that was specifically for teenagers. You aged out of it by the time you turned 18 or 19 to ensure that it remained a safe space and a non-predatory space so that teenagers could have that space to meet other youth who are queer and learn about and talk about what it meant to be queer and to better understand themselves and have access to resources and support. And it was facilitated by an adult at all times, but it was really very youth led. Uh, they brought in Planned Parenthood to talk about safer sex practices, to talk about sex education, because of course the school systems were not providing any gay education for sex ed whatsoever. At that time in the early 90s, it was it was abstinence mostly education and anything beyond that was definitely talked about in terms of heterosexual reproduction and certainly nothing was talked about in terms of understanding what gay sex even looks like or um, what to expect or what is safe not only in terms of in terms of the potential for STIs and things like that, but also like what is what does consent look like in in our relationships and what does safety, like actual physical safety, look like in our relationships? And what does coercion look like? What does a healthy emotional boundary look like in our relationship? What does it what what is supposed what is it supposed to feel like? Um, physically, and those sorts of things that, you know, certainly weren't happening in school conversations. So, so we learned about that in Windfire, and we were really blessed to have that opportunity, to be honest, to have those frank conversations. And some members of Windfire went on to become peer educators through Planned Parenthood to then, to then provide that information to others in, in other capacities outside of Windfire as well especially as schools became a little bit more open-minded and, and started to then allow Planned Parenthood to come in and provide some of that peer education in schools as well sometimes. So that's really important work that was being done as well that came out really in the 90s, but it was building on work that had been done in the 80s. And so that's super important, right? And of course, now we have more work being done. A lot of that work is work a lot of what is happening today is work that we take for granted and don't really realize is built upon the work that happened in the past. A lot of a lot of what we see today that that we, you know, like today we have an organization called the Grand Rapids Trans Foundation, which is a fantastic organization that provides scholarships for trans students in Kent County for college university undergrad and grad students and anyone that is a trans person gender non-conforming non-binary like the entire trans umbrella can apply for those scholarships they range from 500 to i think 2500 dollars per year and they are need-based they're designed to to address the fact that trans students tend to have less financial support in college for a variety of reasons and tend to be underemployed, tend to have other financial constraints, may be distanced from family, may have more health impacts and other health needs that are costing money, including cost of transitioning, right? That there isn't a lot of financial support for. So they're digging into their budgets to pay for that. And, and that cuts off some of the, the money that they would spend on college, you know, perhaps. And getting a college education improves their chances to have better, you know, job positioning in the market. 
And so the Grand Rapids Trans Foundation is, is working to alleviate some of those barriers for a college education. They also provide name change workshops and connect trans people with local attorneys that support them through that process. And there's some scholarship funding also for, for that process because the legal process can be quite expensive for that as well. And that is super important work that exists in part because of the work that has gone before it that that's made it possible for us to get to the point that we can now say oh hey uh, trans people need this kind of specific support so now we can do that in the same way that a lot of schools now have pride groups and colleges and high schools have pride groups when i was in high school we didn't have a pride group a lot of schools now have gay and lesbian and straight alliances. My son, when he was in school, was a part of those alliances that included allies even so, so that they could work together to figure out how do we support queer students in the school where allies become an active part of supporting those students and working together to ensure that administration and teachers are treating queer students with respect and that their needs are being met. And when I was in school in here in Grand Rapids, that absolutely did not exist. I had friends. I, I experienced less of this, to be honest, for a number of reasons that frankly have a lot to do with being assumed to be white. But because particularly it was my, my friends of color who were much darker, black friends, um, undocumented brown friends, et cetera, who, um, and, and especially male friends who experienced it far, far worse, who, who were explicitly told by teachers and administrators, really blatantly, horrifically terrible, discriminatory things about their appearance and about their demeanor and, you know, to just suck it up and deal with the bullying and and oftentimes teachers and administrators were the actual bullies right and and we know that whereas that absolutely still happens today bullying still happens but i think that we've built up better systems of support and challenging that than what we had when i was in school and gsas are one of the ways that we've done that and of course those exist nationally, but you know, I'm glad to say that those exist here in Grand Rapids as well. And you know, I wanna say that one of the ways that these organizations have come to exist, also, you know, we, we don't want to focus in on, you know, bar and club culture and that sort of thing necessarily. But I wanna say that bar and club culture does have a place in queer culture. Uh, for two reasons. One, because it is part of where we where we experience some joy. And I don't mean in just in terms of drinking and drug use, uh, because club culture doesn't necessarily have to include those things. Uh, there are many ways to enjoy the bar or the club without overindulgence or indulgence at all. But also because I want to, I want to argue that bars are a site of resistance, as we all know, when we consider Stonewall as, you know, one of the many sites of re resistance that that we always look back to in our history. I dislike it when we argue that that is the start of <laughs> queer resistance and the start of gay rights because it's absolutely not, but it's one of many sites of resistance that we point to in our history for where gay rights in the US definitely was occurring. And I, I want us to recognize that that is where a lot of resistance has happened all over the country and indeed all over the world, including here in Grand Rapids. So it is important to acknowledge that the apartment lounge is the oldest bar gay bar in Grand Rapids and that it's still open. It was established in 1972. It has moved around to several different locations throughout Grand Rapids over the years. And it is currently downtown. And, you know, 
1972. It's been there for a long time. And, and it was family owned by, by a particular couple who sold it to another gentleman who has owned it now for several years. And, you know, and it's still going fairly strong. And, you know, that is a place where queer people have gathered for a long time. And I will say, I, like many others, have a lot of critiques of it. It is not a place that I frequent anymore for some really important reasons, but bars serve a purpose as a gathering place, as a safe place for queer people to gather when there aren't other safe places to gather, right? So in that same vein, Club 67 is, is a bar that used to exist on South Division. It was, to my understanding, it was the second gay bar to exist in Grand Rapids. And remember when I mentioned Sean Lynch, uh, who started the Windfire Group? I actually knew about Club 67 because that was one of the first uh, gay bars that I went to when I turned 18. But I found out a little bit of history through Sean Lynch's family because that was a bar that his father had gone to frequently as a gay man when he was younger because it was like the apartment. It was at the time the only safe place for gay people to meet up. And it, it was very important for gay men and women to have a place to go for lesbians to have a place to go where they could freely be lesbians, for gay men to have a place to go where they could freely be gay men. Because at the time it wasn't safe to freely be who you were anywhere else. And to have a, a bar that you could go to and once you were inside, it was safe, meant an awful lot. And that's, it, it was in those bars that they made the plans that became, you know, the lesbian and gay network and the AIDS task force and those sorts of things. Like that started in those bars and that's how they met up and found out that they weren't the only gay person in town and, and where they had those conversations. You know, a lot of that happens on the dance floor and at the tables in the bar to begin with. So when I was coming up in the, in the queer community in the early 90s, it was Club 67 and Carousel. Actually, I believe it was Carousel 2. It had gone through a couple of reiterations at that point. Eventually, that became The Cell, which was a leather bar, which also has closed, which is really sad. For a while, uh, we also had Taylor's, which was a piano bar, which was really lovely. That was a very lovely bar because it was open during the afternoon, um, during the day. Actually, I think it was even open for lunch. So it was just a very lovely, casual bar that also served as an after our hours bar. So after the clubs, we could go there and it was a piano bar. And instead of going home, we had another bar to go to and hang out and have soda and and party for a while without alcohol and listen to the piano player and sing along. And, and we had a great time and it was great for community building. And then another bar opened Diversions that also had, you know, was open during the day and had, uh, it had karaoke, it had trivia, it had those sorts of things. You know, the, the ways that we think now of contemporary bar activities. Club 67 eventually closed and is now um, known as Rumors Nightclub. Of course, the clubs also host uh, drag shows and and various uh, fundraising events and all of those sorts of things as well. The nightclubs uh, also have been primary places that have hosted HIV testing sites at times. Like I said, very, various fundraising events, um, both on a personal level to fundraise for individuals in need and also for organizations. You know, so, so there's a lot of good work that happens in those clubs as well. And, and a lot of community building. Aside from that, we've had um, a couple of other organizations and establishments like there's the Diplomat Club, which was established in 1980. It's a bathhouse and health club. 
It has been owned by the same family since it opened in 1980. It is specifically for gay men, so I have not been there and, and I'm not super familiar with it, to be honest. And like many other organizations, there's um, some really important and valid critique of of how it is managed and and who is welcome in it and and those sorts of things as well. One of my favorite places actually in the 1990s was Sons and Daughters, which was a coffee house that also was a bookstore and also um, functioned as an art gallery. What made Sons and Daughters really particularly special, it, it was opened in, the in 1990. And so I spent a lot of time there because I wasn't able to go to the clubs until 19, late 1992. So it was a place that I could go uh, before, I, before I could go to the club. So it, it was a social gathering place where youth could, could hang out and it was a safe place for us. So it was a place that they purposely ensured was non-predatory and safe for youth to be and where we still were able to meet up and, and be in the same way that the bar served as an important place to meet other gay people. And when, when there weren't a lot of places where you could openly be gay, sons and daughters was that for younger people. And also, of course, adults were there as well, right? Um, but the nice thing was that the owners and, and their employees made sure that young people were safe there and that older people were not going to you know, be inappropriate and that sort of thing either. And we could hang out there as long as we wanted. We weren't kicked out or anything like that. Um, you know, I could buy one iced tea and hang out there for three hours. It was fine. Uh, more importantly, it was really central um, for me as, as a bookstore and an art gallery because specifically, you know, of course this was pre-Amazon, this was pre the internet. So we couldn't just go online and look up, you know, am I bisexual? Am I demisexual? Am I pansexual? Am I polyamorous? What does it mean to be asexual? You know, we couldn't look up terms. We couldn't try to figure out what things meant. We didn't have the ability to, to figure those things out online and build whole communities online. And we didn't have the ability to order books and have them delivered to our houses easily. So we went to the bookstore and that bookstore had all queer books. That's where I discovered you know, Gloria Naylor's The Women of Brewster Place and Rita Mae Brown and, and a lot of other queer authors. And also where I found books about how do you explain to your parents that you're gay and what do healthy queer relationships look like? And what is the difference between gay and queer? And which word should I be using? And, you know, those sorts of things that, that at that time you weren't going to find if you went to any other bookstore either. Uh, at the time, you were lucky if there was a shelf in a bookstore for gay issues. And if there was a shelf in a bookstore on gay issues, um, at least half of the books on that shelf were uh, Christian books telling you that you were a sinner <laughs> and, and how to fix it, right? So, uh, you know, it was a really big deal to actually have a, book, a whole bookstore that was just about being gay. And I recently actually read somebody who said that we're really, today we're back to that, oh, we now have a shelf of gay in bookstores again, right? We're, we've sort of digressed back and reverted back to that. We get a shelf now, you know, hopefully it's a more positive shelf these days, but we're back to that where, you know, not very many gay bookstores still exist. Now we're back to 
uh, the idea that bookstores need to um, cater to a broader audience. So even if they are positive, they're catering to a broader audience instead of just being queer. And, you know, it, it was really awesome as a young person to have a place that I could go to that was just soaking in the queerness. And, you know, they had, they had a few gifts, a little bit of jewelry, a little bit of, you know, you know, greeting cards and, you know, magnets and calendars and fun, fun little things like that too, you know, not an awful lot, but enough things that now we would just, you know, order online on Etsy and things like that, which is also great. You know, it's great that now we can actually buy directly from artists who have shops online and that, you know, and that things are much more accessible. It's, it's wonderful that, that we can now connect with each other much easier than we could back then. But I have to say, it's also kind of sad that, that we don't have those spaces anymore. And another thing that was great about Sons and Daughters was um, that they did host artwork by local queer artists and that was available for purchase and, and they curated it. And so it was good artwork. It was interesting artwork. And sometimes it was really challenging artwork. And, you know, they included artist statements sometimes, not always, but sometimes they had significant artist statements that went with it and that made you have to think about the art. And sometimes it was really obvious queer themes and sometimes less so because, of course, queer artists can make work that isn't necessarily explicitly about being queer. We're multifaceted people and that's awesome. But, but it opened my mind towards more contemporary art and towards a, a lot of things that I otherwise wouldn't have necessarily known or thought about. And that was really important for me as a young person to even think about like, oh, you can do this, you can do these things, you know, to, to, to consider the vast options before me for my own future as a queer person, even just to consider that I could grow up at all was pretty amazing and, and powerful and, and to have the opportunity to do that in a safe, comfortable, cozy uh, space was was really important. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the owners, it, it was a couple, uh, Jeff Swanson and Dennis Comack. Uh, Comack actually was one of the founders, one of the original founders of the Lesbian and Gay Community Network of West Michigan also. they That couple is who had owned Sons and Daughters. And when Comack died of AIDS complications in 1994, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Swanson ended up closing the bookstore and I believe actually moved out of town to my understanding. And, and like I said, you know, today we, we do have some independent bookstores, but they have found that, that they have to be more expansive and, and, and that bookstores and coffee houses don't, it's trickier to stay in business these days in, in the age of the internet and everybody ordering online. Obviously, the ability to order online also means things are more accessible to more people. So I'm not knocking that reality per se either. The world is just different, right? It is. It's it's different. And, and trying to figure out how to keep businesses open is trickier. So today, we we don't have queer specific spaces in the same way that we used to have in Grand Rapids. And so today what we do have is an awful lot more queer owned businesses. We have an enormous number of queer own, owned businesses, which is fantastic and wonderful. We have, you know, outside coffee, which is a great little outdoor coffee, you know, truck and space, little dog friendly, little park type type space next door to Woosaw Outfitters, which is also queer owned little um, store. And, and we have all kinds of shops and stores and, you know, florists and photographers and artists and jewelers and, you know, so many businesses and restaurants that 
you know, we're able, it's safer to be out as queer people in Grand Rapids. And so we have a lot of queer owned businesses and we have more out people in Grand Rapids and that's great. But there's a big difference between being a queer owned business and being a space that is for queer people and that centers queer people. And um, unfortunately, the only places we have now that center and are for queer people, uh, for the most part, are actually just bars. And it's great that we still have those too. But we do also need to have places that aren't centered around alcohol. And we do need to have places that are safe places for youth to go and that are quieter places and we need places that are more inclusive where where more of our community feels safe where places that don't feel like they're only for people that have money places that don't feel like you have to spend a good amount to be welcome or to stay there places that don't require that you accept a constant barrage of noise because some people need quiet and places that work for different bodies and different abilities and places that are actively anti-racist and anti-oppressive and that, that literally welcome everyone in the community to be there and to feel safe and welcome at all times. And that's what Sons and Daughters felt like for me and for a lot of my friends and i did have very diverse friends and i've talked to i'm still friends with some of those people so i've talked to them and asked them if my perceptions were wrong <laughs> if my memories were wrong <laughs> and um and they agreed they they remember sons and daughters very fondly as well the sun has set on on the possibility of something like that but but it would be lovely to have spaces of that ilk still and we don't but that's that's the history of grand rapids is is that we have had an enormous amount of community building that has never properly acknowledged certain segments of the community and has always kept certain segments a little bit distant and now going forward what we really really need to do is to welcome in and bring those segments together much much better than we have done in the past and and that's going to mean that some of us have to give up and talk less and and take up less space and give up a little bit of of our power and give a little bit more money and that sort of thing to make that possible. But I think that's really where, where we need to go as a community and what's going to make Grand Rapids greater and, and ensure that in the future, our descendants and queer Grand Rapids gets to say, to look back on the history of today and say, you know, oh yeah, Grand, Ra Grand Rapids actually you know, the queer history of Grand Rapids has some really great things that that were done and and changed some some lives and did some wonderful things. There's there's some great things that happened in the past, but we we've still got a long, long ways to go. And we could be doing a lot a lot more, in my opinion, that builds on what has previously been done. And, and that includes, you know, continuing to address HIV, but also addressing other things because queer people are impacted by so many other things than just HIV. We're, we're impacted by poverty. We're impacted by low literacy. We're impacted by COVID now, right? We're impacted by difficulty finding and sustaining work that is responsive to our real needs and respects us we are under underemployed oftentimes and underpaid and we just we think of the queer community as this monolith that tends to be white and middle class and that is no longer true we are so diverse 
we are black and indigenous and latina and undocumented and immigrant and arab and somali and refugee and muslim and jewish and we are non-binary and genderqueer and non-conforming and trans and intersex and asexual and bisexual and pansexual and married and perpetually single and polyamorous and with lots of children in blended families and intentionally childless and heartbroken over child loss and we look so many different ways and we have created and developed families that look so many different ways with our chosen people and we need to be much more cognizant of all of those things and ensure that all of us are being cared for and that the history of Grand Rapids includes all of us and shows the ways that all of us have contributed to that history and to the fabric of Grand Rapids as well. You know, not only to what makes queerness, but to what makes Grand Rapids as a whole, because the culture of Grand Rapids is, is what it is. Uh, but, but we also have a lot to do with what is cool about Grand Rapids. Any, anything that you think is actually cool about Grand Rapids, it's probably because of queer people, quite honestly. Um, and it's probably, frankly, because of queer people of color, actually. Probably because of Black and Latina and indigenous queer people who aren't being named and remembered and thought about and often aren't being paid for the work that they did behind the scenes either. So, you know, it's it's a lot of volunteer work and it's a lot of a lot of um, passing a few dollars back and forth. In in the same way, you know, that that the history has shown that that community support piece always being key to how HIV was addressed, to um, to caregiving, to to how to how um, the Pride Center was begun to to all of those things. It's always been about people coming together and and figuring out how to care for each other. And that has always been what has ha been happening. And we just we need to figure out how to do it even better and in a more sustainable fashion. That that's the history of queerness in Grand Rapids, in my opinion.